The great LeVar Arrington joining us now. LeVar, the Super Bowl really sucked. I'm just going to be honest. You're a defensive guy. You probably enjoyed it. I hated every minute I of it. I did love uh, it. I loved it. What? I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, what I am going to hate almost as much as the Super Bowl is the next seven months of folks trying to tell me, well, now the blueprint's out. This is how you stop the Chiefs. I, I don't believe that to be true, but you as a defensive player, how much of what the Bucs did do you think can be duplicated by other teams, or is it more about Bucks personnel, Chiefs banged up offensive line, and everything that was special to that game, or do you think the blueprint could be out on the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes? Well, I think the blueprint was out on, on their defense, I mean on their offense, excuse me, before this game. And I think Todd Bowles did an excellent job. I mean, I was breaking down their offense maybe two weeks prior to the Super Bowl. It's, it's fairly simple. Keep him in the pocket. Keep Mahomes in the pocket. If he's able to break the pocket, you've got to get a hold of him because it becomes a run-pass option, and you can't cover a run-pass option with Patrick Mahomes and, and this team. They're too fast, too quick. So I think people have had the idea of how to, to stop their offense but it is, it comes back to what you made point-wise. You have to have the personnel to be able to do it. Shaq Barrett, JPP, all those guys, White, David, Sue. Ton of talent, ton, ton of underrated talent in terms of what this defense brought to the table. And like you said, offensive line was banged up. Pat Mahomes' foot is banged up. If you know about turf toe, you know that that's a very difficult injury to play through. So I think there were a lot of elements that played into why they had so much success against the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. I would not get too confident if I'm a defensive coordinator for other teams, Nick, thinking as though I now can do what Tampa Bay did. If we recall, Oakland did it to them as well, and nobody else was able to replicate what Oakland did until... Tampa Bay played them in the in the Super Bowl. I, I want to stay on the Super Bowl for just a moment because I feel like there's obviously a ton of talk about Brady and there should be the seven Super Bowl rings. And there was a lot of talk about Todd Bowles and the defensive line. But what I thought was one of the very most important parts of why the defense was able to function the way it did was those two linebackers you mentioned, Levante David and Devin White and the outrageous speed those two guys have. What, when you watch the game from their perspective, what do they unlock for that defense, particularly against a team with Travis Kelsey? Well, I mean, I loved watching them play for the simple fact that I get so sick and tired of hearing people talk about how linebackers can't cover. We're, we're probably the most well-rounded athletes on the football field. We have to be as strong as an offensive uh, defensive lineman. We have to be as agile as a safety and as a cornerback because we're asked to do what both of them do. There's nobody else on the field that's asked to do as much as what a linebacker is asked to do. So seeing Levante and, and, and Jay White get into the game the way that they did um, and cover the center of the field because that's what – Kansas City has done all season long. They've made a living on reading the center of the field. See where the linebackers are. The linebackers are in front of Kelsey or they're trying to cover Kelsey in space. I don't care if you're a safety or, or corner. If you're trying to cover a, seat, a receiver, a guy that can move like Kelsey in space for too long, he's going to get open. So the fact that these guys were able to run with Kelsey in that throw zone that Pat Mahomes loved, the sweet spot, the honeycomb spot for him and, and the rest of those guys, um, it shut everybody down. They shut off the faucet on, on uh, Kansas City, Nick. That you cover, and when you have linebackers that can cover the center of the field like that, you have shut off the faucet of offensive production. All right, LeVar, let's leave the Super Bowl there and never discuss it again the rest of our lives. Um, oh, all right, okay. are you surprised that, uh, that the Seahawks brass has not come out, Pete Carroll or John Schneider, with any type of public statement saying, We're, we would never trade Russell Wilson. We love Russell Wilson. He's our quarterback. Are, are you surprised at their silence in this? No, there, there can be no surprise 
when talking about making moves, right? If you feel as though there is something on the table that can improve your team and improve your salary cap in some way, and even if it doesn't improve your salary cap, if it gives you an opportunity to improve your team, then I think that you, you have to entertain it. I don't think anyone's really ever off limits. Wow. Business. So you it's think business, they, Nick. you think they would take calls on Russell Wilson? Sure. You got to be willing to take calls on okay. anybody because that's just the type of business that this is in. It's a transactionally driven business, right? So you can't get so caught up and, and locked in. I mean, would you have gotten rid of Deion Sanders in, in his, uh, his prime? Oh, wait. Deion Sanders left. Oh, Maybe. wait. Deion Sanders left again and again. Like, there are, I mean, <laughs> there are players that you look at and you say, why would you allow for that guy to be traded for or to leave your franchise? And yet it happens all the time because it's a transactionally driven business. Well, in that case, speaking of transactions, can I interest you in a fake trade? Tell me sure. what you think of this, LeVar. I cooked this up overnight. It's a four-team NFL mega trade. The Texans oh, get okay. Sam Darnold, the second pick, the 12th pick, the 34th pick, and a future first-rounder. The Jets get Russell Wilson. The Seahawks, they can go back to their defense and play-action roots. Jimmy Garoppolo, Nicky Bosa, two first-round picks. And the Niners get Deshaun Watts, Watson. Who do you think comes out the best here? Who do you think comes out the worst here? <sighs> Uh, seemingly Russell Wilson comes out the worst. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would have to say, to to the <laughs> and we don't know what they're going to be yet. I mean, they showed some life at the end of the year, but uh, there's still a lot to be to be uh, fixed in, in, in that area yeah. of, of the country. So uh, I, I, I would say <laughs> if the Texans really – knew what they were doing or appeared to know what they were doing, they would actually be the biggest winners in, in the, the trade. But I don't think they know what they're doing well enough to pick the right guys and to keep that team together. It just seems like that's a, a house divided. And, and it isn't just Deshaun Watson. It's a house divided. And now you're talking about one of the biggest leaders of the history of the franchise is now released. And Deshaun Watson being the lone franchise leader in the face of the franchise now not wanting to be there nick i don't see how they could come out on top with the pick if they if they knew what they were doing i would say yes but no so i think the the clear that's the, the clear decisive winner in this one is got to really be the value that seattle's getting with garoppolo and nick bosa nick bosa is is if he comes off that that injury well enough he should be back at form where he can transform that defense, which needed to have that pass rush. It was lacking at times this season. So he would bolster and jumpstart that defense. Jimmy Garoppolo is one of the most underappreciated quarterbacks in the National Football League, and oh. I continue to say that. I think that he's much maligned for, for not a good enough reason. So I think that Seattle would come out on top perceivably, but to get Deshaun Watson and to put him in that offense, if they're healthy and 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 Cal Shanahan can can pull things together, I mean Deshaun Watson yeah, it tra transforms everything. So it I mean I think so everything and the yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, the sales job the, the I entered the sales job for Russell Wilson would have to be done by Sierra. Sierra would have to be mm. like, listen, we've spent a decade in the Pacific Northwest I need to be in the media capital of the world. You'll attract free agents. Like, just, Russ, just trust me on this. So Sierra would have to be involved. You mentioned do J.J. Sierra. Watts' release. You're don't, just shaking don't it. Do don't do it. Don't do it, <laughs> you, Sierra. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned J.J. Watts' release. Mm -hmm. What was your – I want to spend a few minutes on J.J., so let me start here. Okay. What was your reaction when you saw he was getting his release? Well, I, I think that he's if, – if I'm looking at it and reading it correctly – I think everyone's frustrated in Houston. And I think that J.J. Yep, Watt, right. he may have one last opportunity to have a good go at it. Um, I heard rumors circulating out there that they would try to recruit him to get him into Pittsburgh in a limited role. How crazy would that be? I think that that would be a tremendous move for him. Um, if that were to come to pass, that may be a question that you ask me. Um, 
But I, I think that the Texans right now have got to fix internally what it is that's turning off these players because when you have as classy a player and, and well-spoken and understood of, of what it is that, that's going on around him as it applies to him and as it applies to others and he's ready to go, that says a lot. That says a lot about where your franchise is. Like, because J.J. Watt is, is to me, he's one of those guys, he's a lifer. He would have been a Houston Texan lifer. And for him to be taking a release and moving on, I, I feel like that says a whole lot about this organization. If you were thinking you wanted to put it all on Deshaun Watson and say he's not being classy or he's not handling things the right way, he's acting like a pampered quarterback or a player, well, you know what? The greatest football player for this franchise wanted to be released. They mutually agreed upon it, and he's moving on. I think that says everything it needs to say, Nick. All right, so I want to stay on J.J., not about how it ended, but about before the injury started getting the better of him, the player that he was. As a, as a mm-hmm. defensive guy yourself, can you explain to the audience, because I think they got numb to it, because the Texans were running a 3-4 defense. So mm-hmm. he was a five technique. He had two guys on him every play, and he led the NFL in sacks three times in four years. He won three Defensive Player of the Year awards. He had two separate 20 sack seasons, the only guy in NFL history to do that. That's obviously wildly impressive no matter your spot. But much like mm-hmm. Aaron Donald now, a guy who is kind of on the interior and being doubled every time, can you explain to the audience how impossible what he did was? It's difficult. It's difficult. And very, very few people are able to crack the code on finding the consistency. Then you got to stay healthy. As, as he's found out as of late, you got to find a way to stay healthy because when you're getting banged up and, and beat up like that, we saw Aaron Donald take the rib shot this, this year, right? And kind of derailed yeah, their entire right. season. So there are so many elements that at play in order to have the type of success that J.J. Watt has been able to have. Give him credit, his preparation in the offseason, his training regimen, his studying of the game, his, his attention to detail. Those are the things that you have to do, and that's the same way Aaron Donald is. You know, Aaron Donald trains with rubber knives. I don't know if people know that, but Aaron Donald trains with, like, a, a self-defense instructor that teaches him how to handle his hands and other people's hands and they use rubber knives. These are the type of details and the type of minds and mindsets that you're dealing with when you get into the type of athletes that J.J. Watt and Aaron Donald are. So even I I would even say, athletically speaking, I was probably a better athlete than those guys. But to be able to accomplish on the level that those guys accomplish at, I probably wouldn't have come close because the mindset that they had is so different from everyone else that to be able to put it all together and that's humbly humbly from me saying it yeah. is that I I I had a mindset to be the best. I had a mindset to be the greatest to ever do it. But some of the things that those guys do exposed to me that maybe I wasn't doing all that I could do to be the type of player wow. that I could have should have been and those are the type of guys that I truly admire because you see it play out. That is not by chance. That is not by happenstance. It's it's not luck. It is pure talent, skill, studying, preparation, development, and and you got to give them their props because you don't luck out becoming a three-time MVP. All right, that's spectacular to hear, that whole thing. That was great. Uh, Lastly, before you go, Cam Newton talked to our friend Brandon Marshall yesterday, said he's not retiring, he he can't go out like that, and that he enjoyed his time with New England and would really consider going back to New England. What do you think Cam has left, and do you think that's a fit next year? I think it should be a fit next year. I, I think that Cam should continue to play. I was I was happy to see him get an opportunity to get back out there. I think you find out how much he really has left this year versus this past year. A lot of moving parts to have to overcome this season, Nick. 
So for me, I look at it as for New England, the only loss that New England took this year is that Tom Brady went and won a, a, won, the Super Bowl. A, a won the Super Bowl. That is the only loss. That is the only true L that that New England took. Because if you think about it, Cam gave them hope in situations and games and places that I don't think anyone else would have. So they had guys the opting out of the season. You had walls coming down around you in terms of why people didn't want to play or their feelings towards Bill Belichick. We hadn't heard these types of conversations. So to me, I feel as though what Brandon, uh, excuse me, what, what uh, Cam, Cam said to Brandon is, is spot on accurate. I think he is a fit for New England. I think he brought them time and, and they should be grateful for that. And I think even if he ends up being a backup to someone that they bring in, um, I think that Cam has earned the right to have the opportunity to prove that he can still play at, you know, play at a certain level and play in this game, whether starting or being a backup. LeVar, appreciate the candor, appreciate the time. Great job as always, my man. You my man, Nick. You appreciate later. you. Oh, he's hitting right. me with the, you're hitting me with the Antoine Winfield Jr. Deuces. Give me flashbacks to the Super Bowl, what he did to Tyreek Hill. Thank you. Right. Thank you, LeVar. Right. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.